I'm not sure that my talk is so much about um, <laughs> situated technologies per se, but there's um, but there's definitely a thread that um, that follows that 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 links the, the thing that links the three of us together. Um, so in the lab, we, we've been trying to sort of um, codify or to you know enumerate all the all the, the different kinds of projects that we've been doing. So um, you know, making data public, we'll have to we'll have to include a, a quote from you over there. Um, but I think also data literacy is a is a really important word nowadays when talking about big data and whether or not people even understand what they're supposed to be interpreting from it. So what does that mean? And I think you guys are going to talk about that later in terms of um, what we should be teaching and how we should be teaching and. Who, who should be understanding it? Um, also, uh, visualize a uh, new tools for collection of data, and that's a little bit what I'm going to talk about today. Um, making data public, but most importantly, how we turn data at all into some kind of knowledge that we can think with, um, and that means you know, really, really understand in order to be able to think. So I'm going to start with a project that takes off from a, um, a collaboration that I did with um, Dollar and Scopidio and Renfro, and um, particularly um, a statistician and artist, Mark Hansen, um, and some data visualization, um, fantastic data visualization people, Stuart Smith and Bobby Pietrasco. Um, and I'm going to talk about a specific part of the project. It was in this round panorama, which makes it very hard for any of you to see. But it was um, a show called um, Exits, and it was divided into six scenes, which were used to um, illustrate global data about uh, population in motion. So it was re really important for us was to um, find data about people, and that's the only way in which uh, we could, could talk about the data set at all. Um, so without going into the into the whole thing, just to show you um, an introduction of how it was displayed. Can you hear the sound? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there was this blue marble rolling um, around the room, and as it rolled around the room, it stamped out um, new data sets. And this started off with uh, you know, the that famous statistic, statistic you now all know, which is that um, more than half the world's population live in cities and are moving from rural to urban uh, areas. And um, this is a data set that's actually made by a lab called Season at Columbia, which is actually at the basis of a, of a lot of um, the numbers that you hear and the statistical projections. And in fact, right now, they're, they're starting to revise their estimates um, on population uh, demographics. So um, the next part of, of, um, of this exhibit was about remittances. And if you don't know what a remittance um, is, it's a small amount of money that a, usually a migrant sends home uh, to a place in the, in the, global, in the global south. So, Many people migrate for economic reasons and send money home in the form of remittances. The show was done in 2006, <coughs> 2007 numbers, um, which was that 150 migrants sent money to their home country on an average of about 200 US dollars a year. So this meant that when you total it all up, um, migrants are sending remittances to developing countries in numbers that far up, up exceed um, the number of foreign aid that's sent to those same countries. Um, so this is how we visualized it. Um, you know, with all the clans of the world, um, the United States is the, the accepts the well, accepts in, in, in quotation marks. Um, the most amount of migrants and send the most remittances back, for instance, to Mexico, 9 million people were sending back something like $19 billion. So the United States being the first in um, posting migrants, or what they call posting migrant stocks, Germany, Canada, UK, France, and this is not just visualized. This is actually 
to be a movie of the visualization. It's not the actual data. <coughs> It's important to, to say over here that the, the data set we used was not um, data that could be collected by any source. In fact, we decided not to use um, World Bank data at all. And we used a methodology that was um, invented by someone named Manuel Orozco, mm -hmm. which um, estimated the amount of money that gets sent home to home countries based on the GDP of a certain country. Um, so that he did it in terms of estimating, you know, using a migrant database and then estimating the amount of money going home, which, which allowed us to, um, to do a more storytelling kind of visualization rather than just a statistical one. Um, so the reason I'm, I'm showing this is because I became really fascinated by this topic, and in fact, the reason I knew about it was I had taught a studio about it in 2008, which was still starting to work on this exhibition. Um, I've also run workshops on it in Barcelona. So this is a part of Barcelona called the Raval, which is the old town of Barcelona, which is uh, mostly owned by Pakistani people. And so what we did was we you know, documented all the locations where people are sending money home. They're often in hairdressers, restaurants, um, um, you know, uh, internet cafes, um, that kind of thing. This is on Roosevelt Avenue in Queens, where, as you know, um, ethnicity changes um, every three blocks according to the kind of food restaurant you'd like to eat in. But um, you know, mostly in these kinds of neighborhoods, you find Western Union, MoneyGram. This happens to be in um, South Africa as well. So it's a well-known way of informally uh, sending money around the world without <coughs> tracking, without having to track the amount of money that you're sending. Um, this is, we're working on this more right now, but I don't have the current version because I can't get online, but this was done by a student of mine in, uh, in 2008. It's not such a great drawing, but she was amazing because she noticed that on 116th Street, she just kept on re-noticing <coughs> the word tuba, 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 wherever she went, so I always do this when I give this talk. Does, but does anybody know where the city Tuba is? Tuba, yeah. Okay, so it's a city of two million people right outside of Senegal, and it's a Marid city, it's a religious city, and um, it's not a fanatical religious city, and it's built by remittances. It's grown from 1970 to 2010, you know, in, in huge, huge amounts, like from 200,000 to 2 million. And, you know, it really is true to say that it's been built by things like street vendors selling fake product ads. And I don't mean that in any kind of disparaging way. Um, the, the photograph that you see over and over and over again is Andy Van Fonda, who is the religious um, so hero of the city. And there's a mosque that is constantly being built and rebuilt and rebuilt. So we're actually, it's not even mapped. It's not on open street maps. Um, it does happen to be on Google Earth, which I can't show you right now going backwards in history. So we're actually trying to produce these maps to, um, to put online. So um, because of this interest that I have in, in telling um, sort of na national or global stories um, which have an impact, or the, most, the highest impact at a very local level, I've been collaborating um, with uh, Jesse Shapens and James Burns, who have um, invented a software called Zika. They've just been funded um, to do this um, through this project called Main Street. And it was you know, during the Obama campaign, they kept on you know, noticing all these politicians claiming uh, uh, responsibility for Main Street. And so what they did was they invented a, a storytelling mode of allowing people all around the country to upload what <coughs> they thought uh, Main Street was. And um, because of this, they've been using the HTML5 um, platform, which allows you to link together um, Flickr and YouTube and SoundCloud and et cetera, 
as a way of telling the story and then using radio to distribute it and then <coughs> to, to allow that mass medium to allow participation. So I, I can't get on my so I can't show you the beginning of this project, but here's the, um, the interface that we've designed for it. It's called There and Here. Um, and what we're doing is we're always going to be linking uh, two places in the city. It happens to most often be um, a city and a very rural place. In this case, it's Los Angeles and Taveu in, uh, in Oaxaca. Um, in Los Angeles, um, yeah. So in, in Los Angeles, it's actually in a part of the, the city that is partly Korean, partly Mexican, and there's all these kinds of things that go on um, because of that. And um, so here's uh, Oaxaca, here's the, the small village that um, by now second or third generation immigrants are in Los Angeles in what they call Corexico, um, you know, which has you know, strip malls like this. And we're collaborating also with uh, Sonic Trace, who also got a grant to produce a radio story and so that their site is going to be embedded in ours. Um, I hope this works. Yeah. So 
it's a project that's uh, that's really and it will be launched uh, hopefully on May 10th, and then by the end of June we will have um, a, a platform for which people can contribute can contribute stories. And to do that, you just have to upload to Flickr or to YouTube uh, to uh, Mapbox, which is an incredible uh, new web-based mapping platform. And if you know about it, it's really really allows you to make beautiful maps as opposed to Google Earth and it's open source and does amazing things. So, thank you.